if you take away one word of all the words I say today, it should be that top word there, repair. If you are engaged in trying to treat aging and you cannot point deliberatively to a thing that you are repairing, not good. This company name is more of a note to self than a descriptor. Um, we're a company, we have a disclaimer. You guys are all familiar with this. So who are we? Um, well, we're a preclinical company. We were founded last year. We are developing therapies to treat aspects of aging. We're trying to pick low-hanging fruit that other people are not working on that needs to be brought forward, and if successful, will prevent a great many people from dying and suffering. Not in that order. Um, we're a gene therapy company because gene therapies are a wave. They are becoming a, a, they will be the next small molecule. We are quite close to the point at which 80-20 gene therapies that just basically work are gonna be rolling out of companies left, right, and center, which is why we picked this rather than small molecule development. We are regenerating the thymus. Um, loss of your thymus is a major cause of immunosenescence with aging. And we are attempting to reverse atherosclerosis um, via a mechanism that's rather ambitious, a great hack on the problem, and I will explain that later. We are engaged in animal studies at this point in time, and we aim at 2021 to start getting into clinical testing. Who are we? Well, um, Bill and I, co-founders, um, we've both been angel investors in this community back in the days when it was really, really hard to get funding for uh, longevity science and actually doing rejuvenation. It was quite necessary for people to step forward. And as for myself, I've been an advocate for a very long time. I think I first met Aubrey back in 2003, and it was immediately apparent to me that he was absolutely correct and continues to be. And that's kind of how I got into this business of telling people to do more research. And that's what I've been doing. Our scientists are great. We're based in upstate New York. It's a really good place to be if you're a biotech. Low cost of living, great universities, great people. <clears throat> so, um, Richard Honkanen there, he actually invented one of the technologies we license for reversal of atherosclerosis. And the rest of these folk um, are known to many of you, I think, because they're quite, they're quite members of the community on the science side who have been chatting for us for quite some time. And they're all experts in what they do, and they really help us. Ah, so hopefully you're all on the ball when it comes to aging is a thing that emerges from metabolism because metabolism is imperfect. It harms you. Those harms get to the point of causing pathology. So Aubrey went through all of this. The, the point is you want to go fix the damage. You want to repair things. That is how you solve the problem of aging in a reasonable time frame. The only other way to do it is to re-engineer human beings that don't damage themselves. And that's a project for the next century. It won't happen anytime soon. Hopefully, I don't need to tell anyone in this audience that aging is a big problem and a big opportunity. Um, a lot of people die. That this is a bad thing. Or is this generally considered to be a bad thing? Um, we should do something about it. And we can do something about it, so we should do something about it. Bah. I also don't need to tell you that it's a really, really large opportunity from the point of view of making money and having really enormous companies out there doing enormous company things to make this world a better place. Um, we've already harped on Unity and their, their, their financial management company cunningly disguised as a, um, as a biotech at the moment, almost. Sam Ahmed, much the same. Life Biosciences and all the rest of them. Old news to most of you, but some people we do have to slow, show this slide to just to point out, hey, we're not out here on our own like we were five years ago. This is, this is a big deal. What do we aim to do at Repair? So ultimately, we want to pick up projects that are high expectation value, apply gene therapy to them, solve the problem that, that we're doing there. Um, I have a list as long as your arm. I could walk off 30 things right now that nobody is working on that are absolutely great. Um, the problem of the scientific community essentially suppressing all translational research for much of the time between the 1970s and, uh, and 10 years ago uh, has left a research community littered with amazing projects that could help so many people in the world if just somebody came along and championed them. We don't have enough entrepreneurs in this community, which is why you see many, pro many companies doing multiple things. Um, and we ourselves are doing two things uh, because you know, there's so much to do. The two things we're working on, we're working on reversal of thymic involution. I'll explain what that is in a moment. And reversal of atherosclerotic lesions. Atherosclerosis kills about a sixth of everybody. 
Um, your immune system dying off when you're in old age, well, nobody can run the numbers on how many people that kills because it makes everything worse. Um, it's definitely not a great thing. It goes way beyond just dying from influenza or having a huge cancer risk or having your senescent cells not getting cleared. It, it's just amazingly bad for many, many things. So where are we? So we've done our early in vivo studies in mice. Um, we've got the, some initial, initial good data for the thymic atrophy project. Um, we're still wrangling the mice for the cholesterol catabolism one. Um, and we just proceed exactly in a boring paint by numbers, go through the FDA in the standard way that every biotech does. It's just that we're doing amazing things compared to most old school biotechs of the last 10 years because they weren't treating aging. Anyone who treats aging, automatically you have a much, much bigger market. Your company has a much higher expectation value. This should go without saying. Okay, the thymus. Nobody knows anything about the thymus. It's the invisible organ. You go talk to anybody in the community who has a great biodistribution data set for their particular therapy or platform, and then you go to them and you say, so what does it do in the thymus? And they shrug, because nobody ever pulls the thymus out of their, their laboratory animals and checks. Um, but it's in a really inconvenient place. It's under your ribcage. It's over your heart. Um, not a great target for injection. And it's where the thymocytes that are born in your bone marrow go to become T cells of your adaptive immune system. The thymus is a gating function, how active it is, how large it is, for the number of new T cells you get in your body as you, uh, as you, um, as you go forward. Now, unfortunately, this is what happens to your thymus as, as you get older. And it's not even, you know, it's not even that much older. If you're my age, you don't have much of a thymus left. Congratulations. Um, and that this is a very earnest problem because the number of T cells you're getting now just drops precipitously. And I realize I'm showing a room full of investors graphs that are going down and to the right, but you know, this is, this is your life unless we do something about this. Um, you actually, the, the number of T cells you have in aggregate stays very similar across your entire life. It's just that these T cells become increasingly crappy and terrible and like full of garbage and just not good and incapable of dealing with, with what they should be dealing with, which is cancer, senescent cells, infections, all the rest of it. Hence, frailty. Okay, so what can we do with this? So the thymus is terribly placed and, and does horrible things when you get older, but it's a very convenient organ in the sense that it has one master regulatory gene network that controls both its growth and what it does in maturing T cells. Um, and at the head of that is FOXM1. Um, and there is an immense amount of literature to show that, yes, if you upregulate FOXM1, your thymus regrows um, and also works better. Um, so this has been done in mice in all sorts of different ways. Um, and there was a recent trial by Greg Fahey's group using a method that I don't agree with at all um, involving human growth hormone. Do not take for human growth hormone, um, which actually, you know, makes the thymus get more cellular and in turn clearly improves immune parameters in humans. And I know some of the people in the room will disagree with, with that assessment of the data since they're using these very general um, hormone type based therapies, but I think the data is quite, quite compelling. So we're developing a gene therapy. It's really simple. We have an organ which responds to one gene. Um, let's put the protein into the organ. So we're developing a gene therapy. We're actually really working on a thymic delivery system because again, the thymus is the invisible organ. If you go out there and ask people, have you delivered things to the thymus? Do you have something we can license? The answer is always no. Wonderful. So we get to build that ourselves. Um, we work with mice right now, largely, and we work by injecting them in the thymus, which is actually a terrible thing to get a technician to do. Um, their hit rate for the really good technicians is about 60%. You're trying to hit something the size of a raisin in like an animal that really doesn't want you sticking a needle in it. So kind of an entertaining process. But when you do this, this is, this is, this is uh, cell data, not animal data just to show that, yeah, we, we can do this. We can put a viral vector in the, in the cell culture and, hey, we upregulate FOXM1. Um, congratulations. In mice, this, these, now these charts are interesting for two reasons. Um, one is that I'm bold enough to come in front of people and present charts with error bars this large, and I will tell you why I'm doing that. The, 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 the aforementioned difficulty of hitting the thymus in an animal means that what you're seeing here is aggregate data of animals that effectively didn't get the therapy and animals that did about you know, 60%, 40%. Um, now, if science could proceed by looking at the data and saying, well, obviously, that one was one where we hit the thymus, um, then great. Unfortunately, science doesn't work that way. Uh, you kind of have to show the same thing. 
The other point to take away from this slide is that FOXM1 is a self-regulating protein. Um, it controls its own expression, which leads to some very interesting and counterintuitive effects when you actually start upregulating it. Uh, and one of the interesting things you can do in mice that you can't do in humans at the end of the day is, is you can actually put human FOXM1 in the mice and show it upregulating mouse FOXM1, which is you know what we see, which is really quite fascinating. Um, and of course, that's very hard to very hard to tease out if you want to use human tissue or cells. And here, same data, but this time with um, actually looking at protein rather than, um, rather than transcript. So great, we can, we can go and you know, inject mice and, and put, put a greater expression of FOXM1 in their thymic tissue, but so what? What about the bottom line? And the bottom line, we're still gathering more data on the bottom line. We're using surrogate markers right now. Flow cytometry, you run cells through a machine and you're counting cells that have markers on them. And immune system has cells categorized into different types by different markers. It's very easy, quote unquote, to pick up, you know, how many naive cells, how many whatever cells. These, the CD3 plus is a good marker for, hey, now we have more immune cells in general, more leukocytes anyway. CD4 plus, I'm sure you're all familiar with from HIV because they've been using that as a surrogate marker forever. HIV patients don't enough, have enough CD4 cells, we can make more of them, good for us. And CD8 is another general marker and we can break these down a lot further and combine them and look at naive cells and cells in various different locations of the body. And that's currently something we're, we're doing out. But this basically shows that we can replicate what's in the literature and, yes, build a mouse with a better immune system in its old age. Um, so we're actually poking around different vectors right now. Um, we, we found one that's much, much better. The data I just showed you was from a vector that's 10 times worse than the, the vector we're actually using right now. So hopefully in a couple of months, the next time I'm talking to any of you, I have much more interesting data to show. Um, so indication choice is a really horrible process in any sort of rejuvenation therapy because you can use it for everything, which means you're going to spend six months of your time when your company starts out going through every single piece of data on every single age-related disease you can possibly find. And really, at the end of the day, it comes down to who's willing to pay for this therapy. Are the payers willing to go out there and do it? In the case of, you know, um, the, the, the vaccination failure, let's say. No payer is gonna pay $100,000 for a gene therapy that makes your 70-year-old respond like a 40-year-old to vaccines. It just won't happen. What they want to pay for is a $60 drug that cuts the rate of influenza infection by half in that population. It's pathological, but this is what it is. The money is in cancer. Um, there is less money in HIV, but the HIV patient advocacy community will push through whatever works. They're, they're, they're brutal and have taken over the FDA, and they take no prisoners. They're great people. OK, so this is a really interesting sidebar of all the sidebars I could show you, which involve lymph nodes and other all sorts of interesting things in old mice. It turns out that in some cancers, um, FOXM1 is actually implicated in the, ver in the malignancy of the cancer itself. So if you have more FOXM1 in your cancer, you have a better survival chance for some cancers, squamous cell carcinomas um, and a couple of others which you wouldn't really necessarily expect. So, you know, at some point we'll get a bunch of mice, we'll put cancers in them and we'll inject the cancers with our therapy just to see what happens. Um, but this isn't, it isn't a major line of, of work for us. It's just a really interesting thing. Uh, our cancer advisor, Evgeny, is, is really fascinated by this, um, this, this discovery. Uh, which is one of those things that sits out there in plain sight in the databases if you want to go look for it. Anyway, so on to the next thing. Atherosclerosis um, kills a lot of people, like a lot of people. You might think this is a disease of cholesterol. It is not a disease of cholesterol. Yes, you have these cholesterol lesions in your blood vessels that cause them to explode eventually and murder you, but this is a disease of dysfunctional macrophages. Macrophages are the cells that are responsible for clearing this out. Um, this actually works fine when you're young. And the reason it works fine when you're young is because you have very little oxidized cholesterol in your bloodstream when you are young. Macrophages cannot deal with oxidized cholesterol. They go pathological, they go crazy, they turn into foam cells, they become inflammatory, they die. A, a, a plaque is in fact a, um, it's a, it's a disaster zone in which macrophages are screaming, help, help, please save me, send more macrophages and then die. So it's sort of a feedback loop um, that just gets worse and worse and worse. The reason why statins and you know, other approaches to lower cholesterol globally work is because they're lowering oxidized cholesterol. 
enough that you can give a little bit of a breathing room. But these things do not reduce existing plaques to any significant degree. You'll get like you know, 10, 15% um, reduction of existing plaque. There's a study from Japan not so long ago where they used natokinase, which produced a 36% reduction in plaque size. And, th and that's an absolutely amazing you know, advance in the field that everybody should be justifiably skeptical of until they repeat it. Uh, but that's the sort of scale of things we're talking about. You, you have plaque, you're going to keep that plaque. Um, so we need to change this. And, and the way we change this is by improving the pace at which macrophages can take the contents of plaque and return it to the liver. And people have been trying this for a long time. They've been trying it by putting extra HDL particles in the body. They've been trying it by upregulating various genes that are responsible for sucking the, the plaque into the macrophages or kicking it out to the HDL particles. Works fine in mice. All of these things work great in mice. You can reduce plaque size by 50%. Failed in humans for every trial that's tried to date. The reason we will do better is because we're putting a de novo pathway into these cells that catabolizes cholesterol in place. We're not trying to mess with the, the transport of cholesterol because it's clearly the case that we do not yet, we, the research community, do not yet understand something important about the difference between mice and humans in this respect. So Richard Hong Cannon gave a presentation on this, I think, a couple of years ago in Undoing Aging. Um, you take, a, you take some enzymes, which are a mix of bacterial and human enzymes or human enzymes only. There's a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, and it, you put it in the cells via gene therapy, and it gives the cells the ability to turn cholesterol into something else, um, like pregnenolone, for example. If you know what pregnenolone is, you'll laugh. Um, anybody producing a therapy that, that generates pregnenolone in the body is in a good place. Um, so we... we when it did this, um, we're presently working with, with macrophages, which are terrible cells to work with, by the way. If anybody ever offers you the choice of working with macrophages or something else, do the something else. They're, they're really reprehensible. But, so we're corralling macrophages. This is some data from the research showing that, yeah, you can convert cholesterol, but more importantly, you can convert oxidized cholesterol, because that's the problem. Um, and this is a study done a little while ago where we, um, we take some macrophages, you put them in a dish, you, trans you transfect a bunch of them uh, to give them this cholesterol catabolism pathway, and then you feed them a bunch of horrible cholesterol. Um, green here means help, help, I'm dying. Uh, it, it's, you stain for little cholesterol droplets that end up in the, um, in the cells themselves. That's why they're called foam cells, because they have these little, these little droplets in them. And you'll see that the ones we gave the, uh, the rep 0001, cells that we gave the, uh, the stuff to, they're, they're much less effective. There's a little bit of green in there. It's very hard to see if you're not up close. So that's kind of what we're up to there. What we will do is, um, is ostensibly we will try gene therapy and cell therapy, except every person in the world in the community has told me, you're crazy, don't do cell therapy. Um, it's just really easy to do as a proof of concept uh, you, because we have to produce the cells anyway to run the... Um, run the in vitro studies. We might as well go stick them in a, in a mouse. People have done this. They've shown that the raw 264.7 macrophage-like cells we, we use are home to lesions in mice, so we know that's, that's a thing. We'll try that out shortly. But a gene therapy is kind of the way, way we will go eventually, I would imagine. Um, the a priori, I don't have a strong opinion on which of these would actually turn out to be more effective in terms of reducing existing lesions. 